What do Motorhead, My Chemical Romance, Kelly Clarkson, Santana, and Adam Lambert all have in common? Grammy award-winning mega music producer Howard Benson. In our continuing series examining the hard rock and metal landscape today, we discuss with him how he stays current with the ever-changing trends in the music industry and what steps you need to be taking if you want to become a better record producer and so much more. You don't want to miss this. Coming up. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Hi, we're back at the first annual Global Rock Music Summit here at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, California, and where we managed to catch up with one of the premier producers in rock music today, uh, Howard Benson. Howard, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Um, Howard, you know, you've, you've been successfully been producing rock records for over 25 years now. Uh, there have been massive changes both stylistically and creatively. Um, how do you manage to continue to keep up, you know, with the current ever-changing trends within the rock genre? Well, I think uh, I discovered a long time ago that I'm not a very genre-specific producer. If you look at my resume, I've done everything from Motorhead to Kelly Clarkson. Right. So I've made it my uh, business to do different kinds of records right. and to sprinkle my resume with different kinds of things, even though you know, uh, it may have been, you know, it's a little bit of a learning experience working with some of these projects. In fact, they just did a country record. Wow. Rascal Flats. Oh, awesome. So, um, yeah, and now I'm doing Theory of a Dead Man. It's a totally different <laughs> project. Right. But um, I'm really a song guy, okay. and that's how I approach everything. And uh, I don't worry about trends. I think trends, it's, it, it, chasing trends is like, right. I think somebody on the panel says, like, chasing an ambulance. <laughs> so I don't think about trends. Right. What I do think about, though, is having young people in the studio with me and in fact, now I've got two programmers in there who are 20, 19 and 20, and I always have young people in with me right. who are like helping me out, sort of just like looking out for things that I'm doing and go, hey, you know what, that's not, forget that. You know, that's not happening, or maybe we should try this. Right. So I got to, you know, I actually picked that up from David Foster. Right. David used to do that a lot. So wow. I thought that kept him very current all the time. Right. And I just, you know, I, I frankly just don't worry about it that much. It's just more about the, artists I pick and the songs I pick, you know? So it's dangerous when you start, it's funny when I produced Bon Jovi and Santana and those kind of artists who I was so happy to produce because they're, I idolized these guys and right. I grew up with them. I also knew that doing those artists meant I had to counterbalance my stuff with younger artists because you can easily get into that zone of things and then right. all of a sudden you become just a guy that does those kind of bands. Right. But exactly. you have to go, okay, you know what, I just did that. I think I'm going to take a brand new band that maybe isn't even signed right. and do some, like, five songs with them and get them signed and, you know, that starts to counterbalance your resume out a little bit. So, right. I mean, I think it through. It's not something that's random. Cool. You know? um, what do you feel are the most important qualities uh, a rock band should look for in a producer? Um, somebody who said that, well, it depends what kind of rock band it is. If it's a self-contained band that has their own vision, a guy that shares their vision, you right. know. Um, I also think somebody that's willing to be straight with them because I know a lot of producers are not, you know, I'm a very straightforward producer. I'm not like, I'm not there to criticize them to make them feel bad, but I am there to tell them when they're like flying off the cliff. Right. You're so, not a yes man, so you're not going to... I'm not, no at all. I mean, I learned that a long time ago, you know. Yeah. Um, my mentor was Keith Olsen, and wow. Keith was certainly not a yes man. Yeah. So um, I, you know, they're paying me to be honest. I mean, that's what they're paying me for, is to tell them what's going on. And, and you know what, if nothing has to change, great, let's leave it the way it is. Right. But if it's like really, and it happens a lot in the studio when you're with a band, is you're doing, you get to a zone and all of a sudden something comes on the radio and the band goes, wait, we need to sound like that. 
So, you know, you got to really hold on tight to the reins right then and go, you know what? Yeah, maybe that's, we can incorporate a tiny bit of that, but really this is what you guys are doing. This is the lane you're in. We have to right. keep in your lane. That's a hard argument to have sometimes because right. the bands really want to be successful. Right. You know, so, yeah. yeah. Um, Howard, you obviously don't take on every project that is pitched to you. So I'm curious, what is your criteria beyond the music to take on a band? Um, a lot of times it's the people, besides me wanting to do that particular artist, the people around the artist. It's, it's uh, you know, the management, actually. A, a manager, it's better not to have a manager than a bad manager. Right. And a lot of times a bad manager can screw everything up. Right. Or an A&R guy that doesn't know what they're doing. Right. Because as much as I can do, I'm still not, you know, the guy that makes the final decision. When I'm done the record, it can go in 50 different directions. So their management is like, um, not very good. It's it's a problem, you know, with right. the A and R guys. So I like working with good A and R guys. Yeah, you know, cool. And after you decide to take on a band, can you take us through the process of making uh, the record? You know, do you do a lot of pre production, attending rehearsals, writing with the band? How how does your process? Well, pre production changed a lot okay. over the years because bands have Pro Tools and computers and they do their own pre pro a lot of the times. Right. So it's um, but some of the bands I'll still set up in a rehearsal hall and say, play me this song. It right. depends on the band, you know. When I do a, a Kelly record or a, or something like that, it's like a lot of the times the files come in. You got a songwriter with songwriting songwriter demos. We'll make a deal with the songwriter and say we're going to buy these four tracks or these five tracks. We'll use some of their stuff. We we'll use some of my stuff. Some stuff we'll do new. You know, it just it's a mix and match kind of thing. Right. With the band, a lot of times we'll start really from scratch, but we'll use some of their elements. Right. And like I said, theory of the Dead Man's record, we basically did a rehearsal. We started with an old school rehearsal, set up, play live kind of thing. Wow. So I think it's just different. Right. It, it, it depends, depends on the project by project. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, for up and coming producers, you know, who are watching this. What are some of the things that you would recommend that they do to become uh, better record producers? You gotta find, you gotta recognize talent. That's, that's, that, the, that is the number one thing. If, if you, I would say that my career took off when I started to, to, to stop convincing myself that I could turn garbage into good stuff. Right. Because I, I knew that I was pretty good at this. And I thought, well, this band sucks, I can make them and it's great. But the fact is when a band sucks, they kind of suck. So <laughs> right. it doesn't matter what you can, what you do with them. You, you can, right. you just can't polish turn it. Yeah. You can't polish the turd. Right. So you have to recognize something that's really special and sign it to your own thing and then get it signed because that you're not going to get hired to right. do something like that. Most of the time, a young producer is not going to get the gig. Right. That's just facts of it. Every time I made, it, you know, the big moments in my career were when I found a band and I jumped in, got them signed, made the record, and that got me to the next level. I mean, I, pretty much every single time I made a big jump in my career, it was from me finding an artist. Wow. When I did, in fact, when I survived all these kind of things, like between Nirvana, when Nirvana came out and it killed all the hair band producers, right. I went out and found a band called Seed, right. which and got them signed to Giant, right. made that record, and had a gig and was working for four or five years, and all of a sudden that went away. I went to found a band called Zebrahead. Right. Got him signed to Columbia, which is a rap rock band. Right. Then I got to the rap rock world, and then I had POD. So all these things happened because I found artists, right. not because I waited for gigs. Wow. It wasn't going to happen. And did you initially sign them on to your production, and then, you know? No, I knew the a &R guys, so I trusted okay. them that, that if I brought them, even without a contract, I knew that I would... I also had a good manager and a good lawyer, so, you know, you have to protect yourself. Right. So I... The one thing you learn when you do a project is you've got to know... The manager, the, you gotta be surround your surround the band. You gotta know even the girlfriends, wives, everybody because right. you need them to all be on your team. Exactly. You know, so exactly. yeah. Um, you produce a lot of debut albums over the years, and I'm curious in your experience, uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see rock bands uh, make, and how can they be prevented? Well, now it's that they. I I think are the mistake we make a lot, and and they make you know concurrently with us. We use. If we have to bring in too many outside writers, something's wrong. Right. The band needs to have some kind of vision. And that has to do with the uh, marinating time. If you, you need to marinate these things. So right. sometimes you have to let bands write and write and write and write. But if you need to sign a band, you go, nope, they need to hit right away. Bring in outside writers, all of a sudden you take this vision and corrupt it. Right. Now it's not that vision anymore. And then and that's what's hurting our business a little bit. Is it, you know, look, we need hits. That's the deal right now. Right. But it'd be better if some of these bands came to us a little bit later maybe when they could write better songs and maybe we didn't have to corrupt their vision, right. you know? So yeah, I think that's a big thing. And I think bands also, 
you know, look, when I, I got my first use of auto tune, it was a game changer because you knew that people who were average singers could now get signed. Right. You know, I see the musicianship really bad in the studio, right? I mean, it's getting a little better, but guitar players just aren't as good as they used to be. Bass players, forget them. Yeah. Drummers, uh, you know, <laughs> it's sort of like, but you know what? I'm okay with that if the combination sounds original. Right. But a lot of times, you, these guys don't even know where the one is. So it's kind of like, what have you been doing? At least just get, I don't, you, I, you don't need to be a great band. Just be able to play your instruments, right. you know? But Pro Tools has made it so you don't know yeah, what's exactly. going on. Yeah. When you sign, you get a band in the studio, you're like, wait a minute, how'd you make that demo? You know? Well, I'm, uh, let me see, I edited the guitars and I, edited, I used auto-tune, you know, like 60 times on my vocal. And, right. You know, and yeah, maybe that's a sound. Good luck going out and playing that shit live. Right. You're screwed. So I think there has to be a marriage of the technology and still the aptitude. Right. I'm not saying you need to be you know, Mozart, you don't have to be that, but you gotta have some aptitude. At least the yeah. basics down. Yeah. Um, the work of a producer can be very solitary in nature. Um, do you feel that there are certain personality types or traits uh, that are better suited to become producers? Um, well, I have a team of guys. I I'm, I'm probably pioneered that actually, because most of the time there was a producer and engineer, that was it. Right. But I've got, I kind of came up with a process of having lots of people involved. So I have like, you know, uh, me, an engineer, I have a, a, uh, another engineer, I've got guitar techs, drum techs, Pro Tools guys, programmers, wow. you know, so to me it's more like making a movie now, wow. where I'm looking at the aerial view, Right. you know, I constantly, see, my, my biggest problem with a lot of producers is that they're too, they get too inside the project to the point where they, they lose sight of what's really we're doing here. Right. I've never been like that, I've always been pretty good at removing myself, and the guy who really I would say pioneered that for all of us is probably Rick. I mean, Rick could produce from his car because he always had the aerial view in mind and he had great people working for him. You know, I just took it a step further by having more people right. doing it. And also, plus, I like getting involved. I do all my own vocals and I do all my own stuff like that, you know. Right. But I think if you're too, if you're too solitary, you start, you're, 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 you gotta be aware of what's going on around you, right. you know. So, and also, I'm not that, like, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of personality that's ADD when I want to be, but I don't, like, I can focus really good right. when I need to. So I think you need to have both things going on at the same right. time. And I'm patient with these artists, you know, to a point, I'm patient. Yeah. You know, I have had things thrown at me, so, cool. you know. Great. So, Howard, you know, what should bands be doing right now in today's era to be getting the attention of a producer like yourself? Well. You don't really have to be signed, but I think you have to be, you can't have a sleepy career, you know? Um, I think that's really, like, like if you're, if there's something going on, I'll know about it. And I'll produce it regardless of what the budget is. I mean, if it's a big budget, great. If it's a small budget and I love it, great. My Chemical Romance was a very small budget, right. you know? But I met the guys and I was like, this guy's a star. It was so right. obvious to me, you know? Right. But that doesn't come right away, by the way. You need to do a lot of garbage before you figure that one out. Right. You know, I've done, I mean, the first 10 years of my career, 15 years of career, career were done doing bands that were not stars. Right. And then when you see one, it's obvious. You're right. Like, Whoa, that guy's a star. Exactly. So to me, I, I, I would say you just got to work really hard and get out there, play live shows, to write great songs. You know what, there's a reason there's not a lot of bands that come big, because it, it is hard to do this. It's yeah. not easy. You know, you gotta have a great live show, you gotta be able to write great songs, you need to have a star in your band. You gotta keep it together within a band, which is hard to do because right. everybody fights all the time. You got great management, great attorneys, great producer. Most bands fail at something in there. Right. And any one of those weak links, you're, you're screwed. Yeah, you so know? for those planets to align, it takes, yeah. It takes a lot, right. you know. You know, has the reduction in recording budgets in making records today affected your production process? And if so, what are the challenges you face in making records today? Well, um, it hasn't affected me because I'm very lucky to have had as many hits. So I can afford to, you know, I own my own studio, I own my own Neve, I have my own stuff. So even if, you know, the budgets are low, I can still make the records. Maybe for some other guys, that might be harder. You know, but I think that's kind of why Jeff saw it. Jeff in the in the meeting was saying a lot of um, producers that are not you know older producers. I use that word older, <laughs> not nineteen, right? right? Are still working the most because we have the most amount of stuff at our disposal. 
right. we have all the we, I own tons of guitars and amps and all kinds of stuff plugins computers it's hard for a young producer to just start up like that right. it's almost like you have to borrow money from a bank and do it <laughs> like a real get, business yeah. you know start the business but I wouldn't recommend that at all until you have hit records you know I've done everything very uh, with money I'm very like I only buy the stuff I need Right. I'm not like a person that goes out and buys a vintage amp because it's a vintage amp. Right. If, if there's a demand for it and I see it and I go, you know, we need to have one of those. So right. we'll purchase that. So there's a lot of that going on. I think it's I think it's hard for young... You know what? Here's what I suggest to a young producer. I got two guys working for me now who are 19 and 20. I signed them. So they have access to my world. So if I was a young producer, I would say, find a guy like me, get in there... And both these guys worked for two years for me, for, for like, and I paid them per project, but I, they showed me that they could survive the pressure in the studio. In fact, a couple of times, I literally didn't even come in for a couple of days just to see if they could deal with it. The artist, because, you know, that's hard. You know, here you're dealing with a signed artist with a lot of drama and pressure, a r guys, stuff like that. And I came back and I was like, you guys did a great job. What, got two songs done? The artist didn't freak out. I didn't even get phone calls. I'm signing you guys, you know? Wow. But that's how you, you have to throw them to the wolves a little bit to right. see if they can survive, you know? Wow. So I would say that's the easiest way, and that's not an easy way, but that's a way to get from here. It's kind of the studio way, like when you used to work at a recording studio, you were the second engineer. Right. You first were the coffee guy. Like Jimmy, right. Jimmy Ivey was like this. He was right. the coffee guy, then he was second engineer, then he first engineer, then the producer. The studio system does not happen anymore. Right. It's now you have to be attached to a producer. Right. And then the producer, like me, the last thing I want to do is produce every record. I'd rather my guys do some of this stuff, you know, if they're good enough to do it. Right, of course. But they always know they can come to me. The A&R guy go, well, this so-and-so guy's producing this record, but Howard's still there. Right. So, you know, it's not like you're hiring just some guy and no one's there. Because right. that's when you really get screwed. Right. Because, the, you know, from an A&R point of view, what happens when the thing goes south? Right. And they go south yeah. a lot, you sure know. So... Fascinating stuff coming from Howard, one of the top record producers in the business today. So insiders, question of the day, what were some of the most salient points that stood out to you in our conversation with Howard? Was it the most important qualities you should look for in selecting a producer? Or was it his criteria for taking on a project beyond the music? Or was it his views on what types of personality traits make for a successful record producer? Or maybe it was something else that connected with you. We'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the description below as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you would want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.